Julie Jensen wrote a letter before her death, a letter that would set the stage for a shocking and twisted tale of murder, deceit, and greed. Her words from beyond the grave put her killer husband behind bars twice. Let's recap. Hey, I'm Amy. Thank you for watching True Crime Recaps. This is the only channel bringing you all the crime in half the time because you got places to be. And if that sounds good to you, it would mean a lot to us if you would give this a thumbs up and I don't know, maybe even share our channel with someone you love or just, you know, really like. It really helps us grow and it means more than you know. And now I sound like Dr. Seuss. Let's talk marriage. Some go the distance. Some, like Mark and Julie Jensen's, are doomed to fail. After 14 years and two sons together, their marriage was in the toilet. And then Mark found his wife dead in their bedroom, December 3rd, 1998. There was no murder weapon in sight and no signs of a struggle. It seemed pretty clear what happened. Julie took her own life. Or did she? Let's start at the beginning with two college lovers who had their whole lives ahead of them. From the outside looking in, the Jensen's had it all. Mark and Julie met over a rack of ready-to-wear suits at Sears. They were co-workers and it turns out classmates at the University of Wisconsin, so naturally they started hooking up. Well, Julie wanted to be a nurse, but it didn't pan out. Meanwhile, Mark was on the fast track to a career as a successful stockbroker. Is this the perfect man? Seemed like it. But marrying Mark was going to be all about the tell death do you part section of their vows. They said I do in 1984 and moved to Carroll Beach, a small neighborhood in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Beach, Prairie, Pleasant, Wisconsin. Sounds like nothing bad can ever happen, right? Their first son was born in 1990. Now, kids can bring some couples closer together. Other couples have a hard time adapting to the new addition. In this case, Julie's family history of depression caught up with her hard. She spiraled into postpartum depression and began seeing a therapist. He put her on antidepressants, but also insisted on talking to Mark as well. Julie was feeling like Mark didn't love her anymore, so seeing both Jensen's might help restore their marriage. It didn't. But they put up a good front. The little family, Mark, Julie, and their little boy, were like an ad for patio furniture. They're always out in the backyard. They're grilling. They're laughing. They're playing. They're the kind of family that makes you look at your own family and be like, what are we even doing with our lives? But as they say, you never know what's really going on behind closed doors. As the years roll on, one fact becomes obvious. There's nothing perfect about the Jensen marriage. They look like a team on the outside, but they're bitter rivals on the inside. And it doesn't take long for their problems to start spilling out. In a shocking confession, Julie tells their friends and neighbors, Ted and Margaret, that Mark isn't happy with their sex life. He wants a little bit more kink in their cuddle. He's even taken to comparing Julie to the 20-somethings he works with in the city. They stay out until three in the morning. They're clubbing, they're partying, they're having all kinds of crazy sex. But Julie's past all that. Well, I mean, maybe not the sex part, but she's happy at home with her kids. Mark is gonna cheat on his wife. I know that, you know that, the neighbors know that, but it's actually Julie who strays first. Though Julie forms a friendship with her co-worker, Perry Tarika. He too was going through a divorce and he had a young child at home. So they bonded over their similar situations and slowly but surely their friendship blossomed into more than office chit chat. The one weekend while Mark was away and her oldest son was a year old, Julie invited Perry over to the house just, you know, for an innocent dinner, but that turned into a weekend in bed and sort of an impromptu counseling session. Perry heard all about Mark's weird new paranoia. Apparently, Julie had found a recording device in the bedroom. She thought her husband was even recording her calls. And as she talked and talked, Perry started to feel a little bit, you know, more like hair prints and shining armor. Knight in shining armor? You know what I mean. Basically, Julie was like, my husband is weird and strange and here you are. Not weird and strange, so this is amazing. And he started to feel like this was amazing too. But their affair didn't last longer than the weekend. Julie called it off. 
He was starting to think they were in love, but Julie didn't want trouble at home. She cut all ties. She even left her job and she kindly asked Perry not to contact her again. But Mark couldn't forgive and forget. If he was paranoid before, he dialed it up to an 11 after he found out about the affair. Realizing that he was never going to get over it, Julie filed for divorce in 1991, but she dropped it when Mark refused to let her leave. Now, you could look at that as a sign that he wanted to move past it, or you could look at it like Julie did. In her own words, Mark would kill me before he divorced me, and she was right. Mark didn't want to deal with the hassle of divorce and splitting custody and paying alimony and all those other nasty things that come along with a failed marriage. So they tried to make it work. In 1995, the Jensens welcomed another son into the world, but sadly, their second child didn't bring them any closer together. And through it all, for years, someone kept harassing the family. An obscene caller would ring over and over again. Pornographic images of men would show up on the doorstep. Mark had a feeling it was Perry, but Julie had a feeling it was Mark. Mark had an obsession with male genitalia. He was obsessed with his own, a body part he named Boy Scout because he was a Boy Scout as a kid, not because he wanted Boy Scouts. He was also fixated on Perry's member. He asked question after question and he could never seem to get enough information about it. His search history was full of penises. He downloaded thousands of images of penises. Peni? They were even organized and saved by favorites. What? What were his favorites? What? Okay. Inter-Officer Ron Kozman of the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. He became the other man in Julie's life. Not in a sexual way. They got to know each other because Ron responded to 30 harassment calls at the Jensen home. He was practically there once every few months between 1992 and 1998. As he got to know Julie over the years, he learned a lot about her strained marriage. And with each passing year, Julie became more depressed and paranoid. Her husband was planning something. She just knew it. I mean, he was definitely cheating on her. In 1998, Mark took a new job as the office manager at a financial firm about 30 minutes out of town. There is where he met Kelly Brooks, an engaged woman who liked to complain about her fiance. They unloaded their relationship baggage on each other, which is basically sexually catnip, and they soon started seeking comfort in bed. Similar to Julie and Perry's relationship seven years before, but much more intimate, much more dangerous. Unlike Julie and Perry, Mark saw Kelly as his exit strategy. He wanted to be with her, but he wasn't about to risk losing his kids and his money in a messy divorce. So he had a problem, and he figured he knew how to solve it. Less than a month before Julie's death, Mark and a coworker were knocking a few back after a long day of conferences on a business trip. Well, after Mark had a few drinks, he starts getting chatty. And his coworker cannot believe what he's hearing. It seems Mark is quite the expert on poisons, especially ethylene glycol, antifreeze. He's like, it's a good way to get rid of a problem, like when you want to sub out your wife for your mistress. And when his buddy asks him where he got all this info, Mark tells him it's all online. He mentions one website specifically, howtokillyourwife.com. Did I visit this website to see it for myself? Yes. Yes, I did. And it's not exactly a manual for killing your wife. So he's done a lot of research online to actually get all this information. He's a smart guy. He's digging through the internet and he learns that antifreeze is best used as a murder weapon when mixed in small doses with somebody's drink. And Julie can't help but notice that Mark is suddenly very interested in having a glass of wine with her to wind down at night. She tells friends that he's practically chasing her around the house with glasses of wine, insisting that she drink, but she doesn't touch a drop. She has a family history of addiction and she doesn't want to go there. Plus, she doesn't trust him as far as she can throw him. He'd often leave his computer open with these websites about poisons still on the screen just for her to see. Now, if only she'd left him to his mistress, but she didn't want to lose her boys. 
Mark had threatened her in the past, saying that he would fight for custody with everything he had. And she was worried that with her history of depression, the antidepressants, the postpartum depression, that he might win. She was so afraid of being poisoned that she was barely eating or drinking. In the days before she died, she was a shell of her former self. When people asked what was going on, she told them. Ted and Margaret next door, her son's third grade teacher, but most importantly, she wrote a letter to Officer Cosman. It starts with, if anything happens to me, Mark would be my first suspect. She talks about a strange shopping list she found hidden in his things, a list that included items like syringes. She writes, he's never forgiven me for the brief affair I had with that creep seven years ago. Mark lives for work and the kids. He's an avid internet user, dot, dot, dot. And then she closes by saying, I would never take my life because of my kids. They are everything to me. She sealed it in an envelope but didn't mail it. Instead, she walked next door and handed it to Ted. If something ever happened to her, it was Ted's job to deliver that envelope to the police department. On December 3rd, 1998, it happened. Julie was found on her stomach in bed, face down in the pillow, and Ted swooped into action. Mark's behavior on the day before and in the days after Julie's death was pretty questionable. So Julie had applied for a part-time job at the local high school before she died. On December 2nd, the principal called to let her know that she got the job. It was Mark who answered the phone and he said, Julie is asleep. She's going to be asleep for a long time. The principal remembers him laughing, laughing. He'll never forget that laugh. And he was right to be afraid. Julie was in the other room dying a horrible death. Even her eight-year-old son knew that something was wrong. He told a friend that his mom was sick in bed, but his dad wouldn't take her to the hospital. And then after Julie died, Mark asked a co-worker if it was appropriate to bring his girlfriend Kelly to the funeral. During the services, Mark looked like he was having the time of his life. People talk about how he was laughing and mingling like the man was at a cocktail party. Well, he certainly didn't waste any time cleaning out his dead wife's things. The day after she died, the neighbors saw trash bags full of Julie's stuff on the curb. When all traces of her were gone, Kelly started visiting, and then she moved in. Meanwhile, investigators were still trying to prove what Julie herself had told them in her letter from the grave. Two doctors examined her body and came to different conclusions. One said she was smothered. The other said she drank antifreeze and died. However, both agreed that she did not kill herself. The strange thing was, no antifreeze was found anywhere in the house or the garage. If she drank it, where was it? It took almost four years for investigators to build a case against Mark. Meanwhile, he'd set up house with his kids and his mistress. In 1999, he married her. They had a child together. And then not long after that, in 2002, he was arrested for his first wife's murder. So, mazel tov. Just when the prosecutor started to feel like they had a slam dunk case against him, after all, they had the murder victim saying her husband did it, but just before they were about to pop the champagne, the story took a drastic turn. Julie's letter was worthless due to Mark's Sixth Amendment rights. Now, everyone has learned a lot about the Sixth Amendment in this trial. Basically, it's a confrontation clause. You have the right to confront or question any witnesses who testify against you. Since there was no way to question Julie and her letter because, well, she's dead, the courts ruled her letter inadmissible. The prosecutor claimed Mark was the guy. He wanted his wife out and his mistress in. Hadn't his victim said so herself? But Mark's team insisted that Julie's letter was nothing more than a frame job. Mark was innocent. His website, markjensendefense.com, paints Julie as a depressed housewife who came up with a plan to pin an attempted murder on her husband. With him in jail, there'd be no custody battle and she'd be rid of him without a fight, except it all went wrong. She overdid it on the antifreeze and accidentally died. Well, the he said, she said trial lasted until 2008, and then a jury found Mark guilty of killing his wife and sentenced him to life in prison with no chance of parole. His second wife, Kelly, divorced him and got custody of all three kids, but the courts couldn't make his conviction stick. 
Over the next 15 years, Mark popped in and out of jail as different judges changed his sentence. One judge would overturn it because the letter violated Mark's Sixth Amendment rights, and then the next judge would uphold it, like this never-ending cycle of guilty, not guilty. And then in 2023, the murder of Julie Jensen was back in the headlines. So what changed between 2008 and 2023? Well, Mark's big mouth. He went back to trial in January of 2023, and this time he wouldn't have to worry about Julie's letter. It could not be used as evidence. He wouldn't have to worry about the officer or Ted the neighbor either because both had since passed away. The jury heard recordings from their 2008 testimony, but that was about it. It was Mark himself that landed him back behind bars. So while in prison, he confessed to several jailhouse informants about killing Julie. According to one of those informants, Mark spiked Julie's orange juice with antifreeze. When the poison took too long, he shoved her face into a pillow and sat on her back until she suffocated. As the DA put it, if anybody writes a book about this case, it should be called Blabbermouth because that's what Mark Jensen is. On February 1st, 2023, Mark was found guilty of first-degree murder. Again, so back behind bars, he goes. But what do you think? Is there any truth to his defense? Could Julie have been trying to frame him and just gone too far? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.